Let's get started. I'm Dan Rundy. I hold the Schreier Chair here at CSIS. It's a really wonderful pleasure to have my friend Bob Kagan, who has written, I think, the most important foreign policy book of 2018. It's called The Jungle Grows Back, America and Our Imperiled World. Um, he has written many important books, but I think this is probably one of the most important books that Bob Kagan has written. I want to encourage everybody to go out and read it. I read it cover to cover twice. Um, I think it's uh, really one of the most, uh, I, I think it's fabulous, and I think it's uh, a clear argument for why the United States needs to stay engaged in the world and help to maintain the liberal international order uh, that was set up after World War II, one of the, really the greatest inventions uh, of, of, um, of all time. So, Bob, thanks for being here. Well, thanks for having me, Dan. I appreciate oh, it. I'm president of your fan club. Well, I, it's a very small club, so <laughs> it's easy to get elected president, but... Uh, <laughs> But I'm grateful anyway. Thank why you. Did you. Why did you write this book? Well, it just occurred to me that uh, it's based on a sort of core concept that we we sort of think that this international system that we've been living in is sort of self-sustaining and that we don't really have to, there, there's only so bad things can get and it doesn't really require our active effort to sustain it. And, what I wanted to say was that natural forces are actually constantly attempting to tear it down. So I have this metaphor of the jungle and the garden. And if you plant a garden, uh, you don't plant it, walk away, and expect it to still be there in a week. You are constantly uh, weeding and pushing back the vines. This is a metaphor that, that uh, one, my personal favorite, Secretary of State George Shultz used to use when he would travel to regions that were not necessarily the hot spots. But he said, you have to garden. Uh, he, he saw it as gardening. And so um, I just wanted to make the point that it took an incredible investment of time and effort uh, and cost uh, of all kinds to establish this order. And it costs a lot of effort to sustain it. And I think that's the, what Americans are tired of. And so I wanted to try to uh, do my best uh, in a short book that you can read at least once. You can read it a, on a plane <laughs> in ride. In a day. But that uh, there would be at least one place that would say, look, this is what's at stake. This is how easily it can all fall apart. And you haven't begun to imagine what falling apart looks like. So what is, let's just, just spend a minute, what is the liberal international? I can recall, I've had a series of conversations with you. I think this means I'm a globalist. I think I'm, but. It's a very but dangerous I, term it's very, these days. I feel like this yeah. is like, it's like a support group for globalists. Right. But, but what is uh, what is the liberal international order? Because I, I you know, I I had heard the term, but, but actually, I it was you had mentioned we, in a number of meetings. You talked about it, and then since then, it, I think I've, I've, you know I think it's uh, it's taken on greater currency as a as a term. But tell, talk, yeah. talk a little bit about. Well, it. let me let me start by first of all saying what it's not, because I think there is a lot of misconceptions mm. out there that are very popular, even among you know, star intellectuals like Graham Allison. So one thing it is not. It was not a response to the Cold War. The liberal world order was not created in response to the Soviet Union. And that's important because a lot of Americans think that, well, once the Soviet Union fell, why do we need to do this anymore? Mm. But in fact, it was created by uh, people like Franklin Roosevelt and Dean Acheson and Harry Truman uh, and George Kennan and others before the Cold War had even arrived. During World War II, uh, everyone thought that the United States and Soviet Union would still be allies, just as they were. So, if you think about the Bretton Woods Conference in 1944, if right. you think about the meetings in San Francisco for standing up the United Nations, that included the Soviet Union in both instances because exactly. we were going to help build this together. That, right, the Soviet Union was going to be one of the four horsemen who was going to help this all work. And if you also think about the fact that American military planners were already planning the forward bases that they were going to want, uh, in a post-war world while World War II was already being fought. So that's one misconception, and it leads to the, to the next misconception, uh, which is that this is some kind of wild, idealistic, Wilsonian, utopian creation designed to change human nature and all this, when on the contrary, it was, it's based on an extreme pessimism, uh, a deep pessimism about the state of humanity and the state of international affairs by a generation of Americans who had seen twice, twice everything fall apart 
They had seen the worst inhumanity that anyone had ever imagined, and they'd seen two things. One is that human nature is capable of, awful, of the most awful behavior, and two, that the international system's natural course is toward chaos and conflict. And so it's, a, it's an order established to prevent bad things from happening, not to create a, a new world. And so that's another thing. And so uh, I think people, therefore, because they don't understand that, uh, they think it's, a, it's kind of a luxury. You know, why are you trying to make the world over in America's image and all that kind of rhetoric that you get, when in fact it was an effort to structure something that could prevent the return of a Hitler, a Stalin, a Mussolini, um, and, and, it, and it did uh, quite effectively. It's, it's quite effective. So, yeah. so talk about what are some of the consequences if we let the jungle grow, grow back? What, what would that look like? Because I think well, you, we're you seeing, paint some you know, of, you seen some we're of the picture of this, it. and it's not, it doesn't feel good. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, this is the thing. I, I think that when, you know, when I say, or when anyone says Hitler, Stalin, Mussolini, I think many Americans and may, maybe even many people around the world say, well, oh, come on. Uh, those guys are unique, and they're almost cartoon characters in our, in our history now, and that couldn't happen again. So stop saying, you know, where we say, don't say Hitler, don't say Stalin. But the truth is, in my view, the Hitlers and Stalins are all around us. They're everywhere. The, the only thing is they're suppressed by an international system that doesn't permit them an opportunity to show what they can do. And the, the incredible thing about the first four decades of the 20th century is that because there was no order, because the old British-led order had collapsed, because the European balance of power had collapsed, and because the United States had not yet stepped into the role that it ultimately stepped into after 1945, all these figures were, all these people were allowed to run wild and fulfill their darkest ambitions. And so, you know, we used to understand that there were always people capable of the worst depravity. Uh, you just had to make sure they didn't get power. And now I think we've somehow lost sight of that. So, so what can happen is, we can see the history of the first half of the 20th century returning, and I think much sooner than we, than we imagine. Okay, well, I, you know, you're, you're a fabulous writer, and there's this, I'm gonna quote liberally from your, to use a, to coin a phrase, <laughs> I'm gonna quote liberally from your book and just ask you just to respond to some of the things that I, I was very taken with. Um, so let me start with, on page 135, the common assumption that the U.S. cannot possibly sustain its position in East Asia in the face of a rising China overestimates China's strength and underestimates America's persistent strategic advantages. Would you just just expand, if you would, a little bit on that? Sure, and I mean, I think that, you know that's one of the main objections whenever uh, someone like me says we need to continue doing what we've been doing. Is that don't I understand that the world has changed and now we can't do it anymore? And the number one example of that is always China. And obviously China is the, the most obvious and greatest challenge we face because of its ability to acquire wealth um, so effectively. And it has not even really begun to translate that wealth into military power to the degree that it could. I mean, they've increased substantially their military spending, but there's much more they could do. Um, Nevertheless, you know, when I would not trade strategic position between I'd, the United States and China. You'd rather be us than them. I'd rather be us than Me them too. for the for the following for the following basic reason, which is, uh, it still is the case that China, as big as it gets, is surrounded by other very substantial, wealthy, and potentially powerful neighbors. And they don't really like the Chinese. They fear the Chinese, and in fact, you know, even when the Chinese move their little pinky, they all go get very nervous. And they call us, and they come and they go to the United States and say, "Are you still there?" Um, Japan is, you know, the third or fourth largest military power in the world, even though it doesn't supposed to officially have a military. And Japan could become a nuclear nation in with hundreds minutes. of nuclear weapons in a week, and so uh, there's. In, there's Japan, there's India, a very powerful country. There's Australia, a substantial country. There's South Korea, another very powerful country. Taiwan. And then, there, so uh, China is surrounded and worst of all, it has this distant superpower, which is still a superpower, the United States, that can back these other nations if it chooses to. And so the only game for China is to convince the United States 
through one method or another that it's not worth it to do so. Yeah, I mean, I just I think about a world run by China. It just sucks. I well, mean, so China's it's like not dirty, run air, the world. dirty air, dirty <laughs> air, uh, crazy one-child policy, um, mistreatment of religious minorities, uh, kind of a weird, uh, corrupt, uh, crony capitalist system. Just a whole bunch of sort of you know rule set, rule rule based. One of the things we we haven't used the term, but is often used as a rule based liberal or international order. That's rule based. I don't you know when I think about China, I don't think about rules. I, and I think about they're really good at stealing stuff. They steal a lot of intellectual property. Maybe that's going to change with you know they're making significant investments in AI, AI but. Um, much of their much of their military ba you know industrial base is stolen stuff from us. Like you said, I'd rather be us than them. You know, and and Dan, honestly, you don't even have to have a negative demonized view of China. Not that I would. Your, not that I'm doing I mean, that. But I mean, look, I don't use rules based uh, to describe the liberal world order the United States supports because anyone who has paid any attention, as you certainly have, to yeah. American history knows that we have not always followed the rules, especially when it comes to the use of force yeah. and strategic uh, elements. We did create a, a fairly good rules-based economic order, yes. which I think part of our bargain with our other partners in the liberal world order is that we would abide by that even though our power doesn't actually require us to. And it may be slightly economically disadvantageous And at us. times we may even, other countries may do better in this system than we do, as Germany did, uh, has done for a while, as Japan did for a while, etc. We get upset about it, but we don't use our strategic hegemony to win. Now, unfortunately, now we sort of are insisting on winning on all these points, but in any case, um, and so it, it isn't so much that it's a rules-based order, but you're right. It obviously wouldn't be a liberal order because China is not a liberal power. You know, orders reflect the preferences of the power yes. that, that, that dominates them. The only thing I would just say in the end is that there's not going to be a Chinese order. What there will be is a multipolar competitive world much more like what we saw before World War, World War II. I don't think any other power in the world is capable of creating a global order of the nature the United States has, partly for simply geographical reasons. The United States is so, uh, it, it, its situation is unique, and, and not because Americans are so wonderful, but just because the geography allows a very rich country that faces no threats on its border other than caravans of Hondurans, um, and therefore can deploy its forces thousands of miles away to maintain stability and provide security elsewhere without threatening its own security, which is not true of any other power in history. Germany could never have created such an order because it was surrounded by other great powers. China can't, Japan couldn't, etc. So I was in Latvia last week for a, a track two with, with Russian stakeholders, and I just, it, at one point they were talking about, there was something came up and it just struck me, I think John McCain said this, that, and I said to them, I said, do you guys want to be the gas station for the Chinese? I mean, is that basically what, you know, is that sort of your, is there, are they gonna, uh, what, can, can, what, what, what role does Russia play in all this? Are they Russia a spoiler? Is, I mean, there's no, there's no, there's not gonna be a Russian order, certainly given, given all the troubles the Russians have. No, I mean, if, if history sort of, my argument in the book is that, History was moving along a certain trajectory, and that trajectory led to World War II. Um, and then the United States winning, or being the critical force in winning the World War II, and then establishing a peace afterwards, shifted the course of the trajectory of history. But it's easy, but the, the deep ruts of history are still there. So it's very easy if the United States stops trying to do that. The people go back to that, the rut. That every, every, all the wheels slip back into their ruts. In which case, what you see, again, is not a Russian order or a Chinese order. You see a world dominated by several great powers, each with their own sphere of influence. By with the their way, their own history, their own histories, their, their own, own ambitions, and, and by the way, hurts and, their spheres and, of influence and, and, all overlap and conflict. That's why when I read someone like Peter Beinart saying, "Let's just let everybody have their sphere of influence," that's exactly the problem. If they don't, nobody agrees on what their spheres of influence are. Right? That's how we got World War One and World War Two to some extent. So, the world I see replacing our order is either one of complete chaos or one that looks a little bit more like 18th, 19th, and early 20th century and Europe. And that wasn't so great. It that was one of so constant, well. repeated, major war. And only this time, 
we have it's, nuclear it's, we, and, we, uh, and, and you know, around the time of sort of you know World War One, we kind of mechanized war, right. and so the kinds of the levels of death were just were just you know right. became just you know exponentially higher. Even right. if it was just conventional warfare, it was much higher. Right, and you know we have this uh, other hope, which you know I don't know whether you were going to raise or not, but people always say, well, nuclear weapons are going to prevent war, and. I'm just so glad to hear that. I remember during the Cold War, we were not so confident that nuclear weapons would prevent war, and we were right not to be confident, because if you go through history, betting against the use of any conceivable of weapon, any weapon. Ha it would, would, get you, would lose you a lot of money. Right, so historically, there, for the last 60 or 70 years, there's been a taboo. We, we have been the only power after that's we ever used, used them. ever right. used them twice. There's been a taboo. But, but it's been a taboo made with, with force behind it, so to speak, which has been our enormous nuclear and conventional capability. Right, so you know, I, I, you, you, get, you see the, the Pakistanis, the Indians get in a tiff, they start, they start saying all sorts of crazy loose things about, well, I can lose a city and you know, this kind of crazy stuff. I mean, it's very irresponsible. Yeah, and by the way, I think that two nuclear powers can fight a conventional war without going nuclear. I think, af after all, every day the U.S. and Chinese navies plan for a conventional war that doesn't go nuclear. Now, there are also miscalculations and things escalate, but I think it's also possible to have a conventional war between great powers that doesn't go nuclear. All right, let me, let me read some more quotes because I just think this is just, this book is fabulous. So I was told uh, by a communications professional, you need to repeat something seven times. I'm gonna repeat your, the title seven times in this. You don't this. have to do that. Uh, really. Absolutely, <laughs> The Jungle Grows Back, America and Our Imperiled World by Bob Kagan. And as I said earlier, this is the, the most important foreign policy book of 2018. And I encourage everyone to go out and read it. If you don't have a holiday present, almost present, over, so you better, and you don't yeah. have a holiday present yet, for your loved one, you got to go out and buy this and put this under the tree or for Hanukkah. Get this no, book. That'll, this that'll is, be, they'll be very grateful. They'll for be that. very grateful. <laughs> it's a, this is a, this is. I, I'm actually am going to buy copies of this and give this out because I think this is. I, I, I don't do this very often, but I, I do this for this because I think this book is really one of the most important books I've read in a long time. So let me just read a couple more things. So while we were grateful when page 149, while we were grateful when communism collapsed, the liberal world, or, world order flourished when communism was the enemy. It is doing less well against a counter-enlightenment that plays more effectively on liberalism's failure, failings and insecurities. Just want to just expand a little bit. What do you mean, what's a counter-enlightenment? Uh, yeah, well, that's, I mean, that's a complicated concept, but I, what I'm trying to say is that we, we sort of breathed a sigh of relief when we were only faced with a traditional authoritarian uh, dictatorships like Russia under Putin, and China un under a regime that is only sort of communist. Yes. Um, it certainly isn't communist from a mostly economic perspective. They're not doctrinal communists. Um, but if you look at, again, it is sort of remarkable that during the period when the main enemy was communism, that was when the liberal world order f flourished like at no time ever. I mean, democracies spread around the world uh, from maybe 20 at the beginning uh, to about, uh, to, about to over a hundred, yeah. and and also when you know the prosperity and sort of coherence uh, of the liberal world from Europe to Asia yeah, look at reached all the yeah. such heights that in fact communism was not able to compete, and and it's worth looking into what that meant that they couldn't compete because the the irony of course is that communism and liberalism spring from the same Enlightenment yes. tradition, and in a way they judge success in the same way. The communists said, uh, we will do a better job of taking care of the average person. You know, you, talk, you look at all the statements that Stalin and Khrushchev and others made, they were gonna surpass the West because capitalism had a, you know, an inherent contradiction that would make it impossible for it ultimately to succeed. Uh, and they also promised to deliver humane values like equality and justice, etc. Um, and, they, and they had the same view in a way uh, of what rights were, even though they promised to deliver them in certain, in different ways. These traditional authoritarian regimes, they don't even promise that. What they are offering, and what many people around the world, and I would say even the United States, are seeking today, is emphasis on family, tribe, 
nation, uh, nation. Uh, they offer the security, uh, they offer you a chance not to have to make your own choices. And you know, we look at human nature and, and we're all sort of, we were all sort of taken with the Frank Fukuyama Hegelian argument that all we want is recognition. In the end um, of history. In his, in his famous essay on the end of history in 1989, that what human beings want is recognition of their individual worth, etc. And of course, that is one thing that humans want. But the other thing that humans want is to let somebody else make the decisions and to have a strong leader uh, tell them what they ought to do and take care of them and protect them. And in times of feelings of insecurity, whether physical or cultural insecurity, which is what you're seeing in Europe today, there is this sort of desire for a strong man. And again, look at the whole sweep of history. Authoritarian dictatorship has been the norm in countries throughout history and throughout the world 90 plus percent of the time. We think, well, because we're enlightenment progressives, we think, well, that doesn't matter. All that history doesn't matter because we've moved on. But we don't move on. We're still the same human beings to a very large extent. I don't believe in the progress of human nature. I believe in technological progress and scientific progress and progress in knowledge. But I don't think humans evolve. And so um, the most natural form of government, historically speaking, is authoritarianism. It's true. Okay, page 154. It took great and consistent exertions of American power and influence to create and sustain this world order. It will take no less to continue upholding it into the future. Americans over the past two decades have been convinced that the U.S. is doing too much when actually it is doing too little. That is the most uh, unwelcome message that one could possibly be giving right now. Well, that's and, why I wanted you here. And uh, I, I hope that at least three or four of you find it uh, plausible. But that's my view. I, I actually think that as I look around, as we look around the world and see the things that we can all point to that are going wrong, some of it is just natural and was going to occur to some extent anyway. And the only question was, are we going to push it back? I think European, I think the return to nationalism especially in Eastern and Central Europe, probably was inevitable and in that the only question is how do we respond to it. Um, but there are other things uh, we see all around that I think are the product of a general sense that the order that was once being upheld with real power and real effort has been pulled back and it's a little bit more open season. So for instance, I, I know that you, I know that you know Saudi dictators and other dictators can bump off their opponents, but but in the particular way that this was done uh, by Mohammed bin a Salman, it was done in the in a in the most sort of blatant I don't care what you think way possible. That's the most generous interpretation you could make, um, and what it indicates and what it indicates when someone like. Uh, Viktor Orban in Hungary proudly declares that he's an illiberal leader. What it means is, in a way, there's nobody home. Uh, and there's nobody anymore to sort of enforce this order in the way that it had been enforced before. And I think we see that manifesting itself uh, all over the world today. Okay, two more. And then I want to, there are a lot of smart people I want to hear from in this audience. Okay, so mem page 156. Members of Congress from both parties have underfunded the military since the beginning of the post-Cold War era, but especially over the last decade. Most of what we need to do to sustain the liberal order will not require sending troops, but there will be times when it will be necessary. It, it w is simply dishonest to tell the American people that the relative security and prosperity they have enjoyed can be sustained without the occasional threat or use of force. Right, and I mean, uh, one of the things that you know I suppose is problematic about my argument here is that I'm not telling Americans that I have the foreign policy that's not going to cost them anything and that's not going to lead to errors and mistakes because every foreign policy does there's a lot of people out there telling you that if only we just pull back a little bit or do this a little bit there's only good things are going to happen there's no downside to their policies I'm pretty frank about the downside uh, to the policies that I'm recommending and I do think uh, Americans lose sight of the fact that whatever else is true, this order rests ultimately on a bedrock of the security guarantees that the United States has offered to the rest of the, to the, rest of the members of the order, specifically in Europe and in Asia, but also in the Middle East. And those security guarantees are fine. Um, and you hope you never have to sort of make good on them, but times will come when you either do have to make good on them or people begin to doubt that they exist. 
So, and even in areas where you think things are peripheral, like Syria, for instance. So, we all chose, the, red line. we chose, well, and not just the red line, in general, we, we let the Russians in, we let the Iranians in, we let um, Assad, you know, kill or drive out millions of people. I mean, there, we, I remember when, <laughs> before we, people were very upset about what was happening in Darfur. <laughs> Many times more people have been killed in Syria than were killed in Darfur, and yet we decided we didn't want to do anything about it because of Iraq. And okay, I get it. But the downside of that is that A, we help destabilize Europe by, sent, by allowing two million refugees to go there and, and overstress the European political system. And we raise doubts all around the world, as far away as Asia. The Japanese looked at what we didn't do in Syria and began seriously to worry that we were not going to be there for them either. In Asia. Yeah. General Breedlove uh, used the term, and I think Senator McCain also used this term, uh, weaponizing refugees, yeah. and that there were, there were actual cynical use of um, making military decisions knowing that they would attack certain communities in the expectation that those people would pick up and leave and head towards Europe, further destabilizing Europe. Yeah, I mean, at the very least, they would have to head toward Turkey, destabilizing Turkey, or Turkey would let them through, and then they would destabilize Europe. I don't know that Russia's intervention in Syria was consciously aimed at that, but it certainly was not something that Putin minded. It certainly didn't mind it. Okay, right. last, last one, and then I want to call on some folks. Page 158 is related to what you're saying earlier. The more we rely on proxies like Saudi Arabia, Egypt, and Israel to determine the course of events in the Middle East, the less it will be a course we would choose. For the U.S., it is not a question of all in or all out. In the Middle East and elsewhere, we will still be required to make decisions, when to intervene, how to intervene, how much to commit, and how long to stay, and the answers will not be obvious, and the outcomes will not be certain or even predictable. Those who insist on outcomes that pose no further dangers and require no further involvement are asking the impossible. Yeah, and I feel like, you know, because we don't want to be involved in the Middle East, but we can't, we can't really claim that we have no interest in what happens in the Middle East, we're doing what we prefer to do, which is find others to, to pursue our interests We for outsource us. this to the Israelis, we, we, we outsource this to the Saudis. Saudis, et cetera. And of course, what we discover, even when it's our allies like Israel, is that they have a different set of goals than we do. They have, they have their own goals. Um, and we, therefore, are allowing others to decide how our interests are going to be protected and how shocked should we be if we find that our interests are, and not just, by the way, our interest in oil and uh, even uh, the fight against terrorism, but our interest in a general international order that benefits us and the values that we care for. All right, like one last thing. So just, so we've talked about some of the costs. You've been upfront and saying there are some costs to this. Just spend another minute on the bennies because I don't think we, I think we sort of, we, assume the benefits, we live the benefits, just, let's just be explicit about what have the benefits been, what, how has the United States been a beneficiary of the current deal that we've had for the last 70 years, and how have our allies been beneficiaries of the current deal for the last 70 years? Yeah, and I mean, you know, it's almost like the, the order was too successful for its own good because it, it lasted so long and was so beneficial that we forgot that there were benefits in a way. We began to believe that this is the norm. Engl but, English as a lingua franca, mm, the dollar. Well, I mean, even, even more fundamental than that, I would say. There are three fundamental qualities of this system since 1945, any one of which would make it unique in all of history, and the three of them together make it, you know, beyond unique. Beyond unique. So one. Very unique. Can you? <laughs> if you're not, my dad told me that very unique I know, is not a not, thing. I know. I, did, I said um, that on purpose. There's either unique or not unique. But anyway, um, super unique. Anyway, super unique. Um, one is it's been the period of greatest prosperity in human history. Amen. I mean, we've, joined, we've enjoyed something like 4% annual GDP growth and throughout all, this we, period. We all ought to pinch ourselves every darn day. Right. When for thousands and thousands of years, going back it to was time nasty, immemorial, brutish and short. It was, everybody was living in a state of abject poverty. Yeah, and that only began to change with the Industrial Revolution. And that was leading to like 1.5% GDP growth and only in Europe and the United States. And so we've, four billion people have lifted themselves out of poverty. We now have the largest global middle class Amen. in history. Okay. Amen. So that by itself makes this period absolutely miraculous. Uh, the second is the explosion of democracy. Democracy was the rarest form of government throughout history. It was so rare that it was almost an accident wherever it occurred. 
And we, this has been a period of incredible explosion of democracy. And the third is, is the absence of great power conflict. I mean, the first half of the 20th century saw two world wars. The 19th century saw the Napoleonic War. And by the way, the Franco-Prussian War was no picnic, even though people think it's kind of like funny in retrospect. It wasn't funny. We right, had the, it's, it's, it's the, cartoonish. Right, people the 30 think Years' it. War devastated almost all of Europe in the, in the 17th century, etc. We have been spared that kind of seismic, cataclysmic uh, conflict throughout this period. So all three of those things together are mind-boggling. And instead, we decided, well, then we must have reached a new plateau of human existence, which let's just enjoy it, uh, rather than understand that this is an incredible aberration. It's a historical aberration. It's not natural. And it will only stay as long as we continue to fight for it. Thanks. That's, yeah, I know. Um, Once you amen. give people that's for your Christmas present. That is that very unique. <laughs> super unique. That is super unique. Okay. So, I, so there's no such thing as a free event with me. I want to hear from some of my friends and colleagues. So I want to hear from my two favorite ambassadors in the back there. I want to hear from Ambassador Wayne and Ambassador Patterson. I hear from my friend who used to be at the IMF who's at SICE. And then I hear from this gentleman. Okay. So who's first? You, Ambassador Patterson. So, so Dr. Here's the microphone. Uh, I have a, so we've failed utterly to this is Ambassador Ann Patterson uh, to articulate the benefits of this, and that's on us. Uh, some of the people sitting in this room, and why have we failed to articulate? I agree, we got sort of fat and happy, and it was all easy for the past 15 or 20 years. But but now the costs are so enormous of not persuading our public of these advantages. I I worry about that so deeply worry. So I'd like your comments on that, and then I'd like to pick up on something Daniel said about India and Pakistan. Some of the reason these countries don't fight is because the minute there's tension, they call the United States, and we jump in with both feet very aggressively and. They like it that way because there's always an out. There's always some, and that too has begun to dissipate, I think. Uh, are they calling China? I don't know who they're calling now, but the fact that we can use our diplomatic might to intervene and, and that countries expect us to do so, that, I, that also, I think, is uh, not as helpful as it used to be. Okay, Ambassador Wayne. <laughs> okay, so. Do we need to uh, go back to a really bad situation before people will again realize what they have to do? That's the danger of what you're arguing. If we could all be logical about it, right, you have a wonderful argument. But it took them two world wars to figure out how to do this. And we had, sadly, to, do the, we had to learn this the hard way. Sadly, we might have to learn it the hard way. I hope not, so we can all keep working for it. And Anne's right, we need to do better. But uh, that's the other option, is that we need a little That's door little number suffering. two. I'm sticking with, I'd like to stick with door number one and just con continue on to him, but you're right. Okay, my friend, uh, who's at SICE? Used to be at the number two at the IMF. Right, John Lipsky. Uh, there are those who think that the, uh, the, world, the part of the world order represented by the IMF and the World Trade Organization, which is a rules-based multilateral approach, uh, treaty-based, meaning that these decisions have the force of international law. <coughs> as uh, We look on that as uh, being tremendously beneficial in the underpinnings, among other things, of this prosperity that you mentioned. Others consider it uh, an example of exorbitant privilege that has granted the U.S. dollar uh, a role that uh, might not be deserved. Uh, do we think that the rest of the world is going to be convinced that this uh, order it needs to be preserved or is essentially dependent on American dominance? All right, let's just stick with those three and we'll do another round. But just re what are your reactions to some of those? Um, well, just taking the, the last point first and then I'll go back to the others. Uh, you know, it, it seems to me the, the simple answer to your question is the members of the liberal world order, which is to say our allies in Europe, uh, and in Asia, uh, pretty much excluding the revisionist powers, Russia, China, Iran, North Korea, and others, they all want to hold on to this order. Now, uh, you know, they, they all, uh, their biggest fear is that we are, don't want to be part of this order, not that, that it's overbearing. Now, I, I think it's sort of inherent in your point is, is there a hegemonic quality to this order? And the answer is yes. And, you know, is there, an imp uh, is there even an imposition inherent in this order? And the answer is also yes. There, are, there is no order without imposition. 
And so there's always going to be a tension in the order between the perception that one power is hegemonic and sort of imposing it, uh, and then the question is, well, are we benefiting enough to put up with that, et cetera? And it's that fine balance that I worry is at risk right now. Because I think most of the other powers have felt like we're, we're Hyman Roth and the Godfather. We always make our partners money. And that they could get rich in this system even if we had a dominant position in it. If we're now going to say, we're going to use this system to squeeze the last dollar out of all of you. We don't care if you're doing well or not. We only care if we're doing well. Then you're talking about a hege hegemonic system that is not attractive to its members. And I don't know where that goes ultimately, but that's what I think is sort of at risk right now. Okay, let me just, I want to, I want to give, I want to give, I want to just put John Lipsky on the spot. Just say, so if we had, John, if we had um, a financial crisis in China, and they said we need to call on the IMM for a big bailout. Just, just put. I mean, I mean, part of me feels like, boy, we ought to take them down a couple pegs and let them have a big old financial crisis so they can't finance their military. I'm assuming that obviously that's probably not the right answer. But what's your? Would you just? Would you just? <laughs> could you give me what's the what's the John Lipsky? What's the responsible answer? The non the non just screw them. Well, remember they have answer. very large net external assets, not external debts. Right. So they don't have a they're not going to have They one could of those. have a domestic financial problem, but it's not an internet not necessarily they're not call directly the IMF. not in the well they could call the IMF to help design a stabilization program. And we could do but that. It's and not, we should we should It's not do an that. external debt crisis for them. All right, but if they called, we should say absolutely, you know, send the fire send the IMF fire Absolutely. Trucks. Absolutely. Okay. They're a member. They're a member. Okay. Right. You know, I'm sorry, if this just prompts the, I think China is such a complex question in this regard because of course there's, there's two things that are in tension with each other, it seems to me. It, it, my ideal strategy toward China is the same strategy we basically offered, the same situation we offered to Germany and Japan and Britain and France after the war, which is basically get rich be economically influential, be a geoeconomic player, raise the standard of living of your people, and just stop with the military and geopolitical ambition. That's the deal we made with Germany, and that worked out fine. And they, you know, basically they ceded strategic hegemony to us in exchange for a free ride. And I would like to do that with the Chinese. The problem is if the Chinese don't want to buy that deal, then, then we are helping them get stronger. So yeah. 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 U.S. policy towards China, in the view of many Chinese, informed Chinese, is to keep China down. For sure, right. So if I say the word keep China down, is that, is that in essence, is that? I, I want to have this apparently impossibly complicated policy of saying I actually want to contain China militarily and, and, and hope for and encourage its success economically. Now the tension comes if they spend their money on the military, which makes it harder. But that just requires us to spend enough so that it's never a good, I want it never to be the better option for them to, to choose to a military. And, and part of that is they've got to have the other option. So if they think that we're trying to contain them militarily and we're trying to squeeze them economically, that to me is the worst of all possible worlds. And, and what I really fear that we're doing right now is we're going we're gonna to squeeze them economically but we're not actually as frightening as we need to be militarily. And unlike Japan, who when we squeeze them economically, they have no other option but to, do, to negotiate to the best ball. deal they can, China has another option. It's not an option from the Donald Trump you know, business playbook. It's, it's a military when you when, If you squeeze somebody too hard on a deal in Atlantic City, they didn't send an army after you, yeah. you know? And so that's a different situation. Anyway, okay. this is a long, complicated problem. Let me okay, get back so, to So Ambassador Wayne talked right. about, well, look, it took two world wars for us to get through our thick skulls right. that maybe we needed to try something other than sort of great power Great power spheres of influence. Yeah. What's your reaction to that? No, I mean, uh, and the, that hopefully we don't have to go back to that. The we don't pessimist have to learn this again. The, the the pessimist in me does not see American public opinion turning around anytime soon. And you talk about, you know, we need to educate them. Well, the people who have to educate them ultimately are their political leaders. I mean, we can write books and articles and give talks and etc. Th but at we're very nice think tanks. We're the at very nice think tanks. Right. But we're a flea on the back of a flea on the back of an elephant. Oh, you're killing me. Yeah, I'm you're sorry. I hate me. to break it to you, Dan. 
And, and so you really, so, so I think until we have political leaders, and look how, there was only one political leader in the last election season who believed in what we believe in, in my opinion. I don't think really Bernie Sanders believed in it. I know Donald Trump didn't believe in it. I personally think that Barack Obama only half believed in it. So the only person who really believed in it was Hillary Clinton, and she was on the defensive the whole time. She couldn't even say what she thought about foreign policy, and she had to walk away from the, the TPP, which she was one of her signature things. So that tells you where public opinion is. And so when I think back on, the, on this period that you're talking about, um, the most gifted politician in the history of American politics was Franklin Roosevelt. And Franklin Roosevelt could not convince the American people after France had fallen to the Nazis that this was something we had to get into. So my concern is, yes, it, who knows what it's going to take. This time, it may be too late. That time, it was really the failure of, of Britain and France and the other powers to contain Germany. And fortunately, they had a United States off in the wings ready to come in. Well, this time, there is no United States off in the wings. There's just us. And so if we get it wrong for 20 years or however long, who's going to step in? And so this is what worries me, that the world could fall apart so it could fall about beyond repair until we get our act together. I, I, I hosted a, a book event for Ben Steele, who did this book on the Marshall Plan. He's done two fabulous books. He's at CFR. One was called The Battle of Bretton Woods, which was the designing of the World Bank and IMF, and I think the WTO is. Is that a Bretton Woods institution? I can't remember. If it, no, no, it's that's not. A it's the IMF thing. and the, the, the World Bank. And it's absolutely fascinating story. But his follow-up book was about the Marshall Plan. And what he says in the Marshall Plan, which, and I, so there were two things that struck me. One was that uh, Arthur Vandenberg, who was the Dick Luger on steroids of his age, was. Um, I don't know who that's a bigger insult to. I'm going to have to know, think about but he's that like, for but a he's, But he's, <laughs> Arthur Vandenberg was sort of one of this, was giant in foreign policy. He's not very well remembered today. Um, helped lead, he gave up his presidential ambitions to run for president, to stay in the Senate to make sure that we got the Marshall Plan done and to get NATO done and to get uh, the United Nations done. He basically did all of those things. He gave up his personal ambitions for the good of the country. And he was a Republican. He, um, he I think, and whoever it was in the House, uh, dictated that they did something like 120 hearings, I think, on the Marshall Plan. And there were something like as many, more than 100, and as many as maybe 200 members of Congress did congressional delegations to Europe, extended periods of time. Richard Nixon was a freshman member of Congress and spent a period of time in Italy, for example. I don't know, I can't remember if Gerald Ford did this or not. I think it was Gerald Ford did, did, was not, but, but I know for sure Nixon did. Um, they, weren't, they did not bring spouses, and they were not allowed to bring evening, uh, evening outfits so that no one thought that this was a junket. And so Nixon spent like a month in Italy. Think about today. A big congressional delegation today is like for five days and it's five members. So I mean, this is just off the charts for anything sort of in our kind of our common experience. They required sort of a major education of the political leadership and that the stakes were so high. Now it also, the Marshall Plan happened because of the Russians invading Czechoslovakia um, and it, there was afraid, we were afraid that it was gonna go communist. So there was a mixture of sort of enlightened self-interest so, so we have to continue to have, in my mind, we have to have enlightened self-interest that this is in our interest, that this is a good, like you said, that, that everyone's going to get rich, this is, a deal, this is a good deal for everybody, that we're not going to squeeze two people too hard, but there's a little bit of a cost, there's a cost, but the alternative is so horrible that, that we, I don't think we, we just have never contemplated the cost of, of the alternative. That's the, that's, so I think that's why your book is so important. And you know, people, the problem is people are looking for another communism to focus Americans' attention, but they're really, it, and so I've even talked to very sensible folks who say, well, let's just make China such a, I mean, because of everything they're doing, they're in, getting involved in our campaigns and they're stealing our technology, so let's turn China into this incredible bogeyman that people can be afraid of. Let's frighten the American people about China. And I just feel like, I, I don't know if that really is the way to go. And I, I will say. You could frighten Americans about Islam. You could just say Islam's gonna take over the world and Americans are already, are more, in my view, more frightened about Islam than they should be. And so you could find these, these, kind of these enemies. We've kind of maxed out the credit card on that too. I mean, well, I think it's hard to, it's hard to scare. I think we've, 
Uh, but for example, in China, I do think the administration will make, will change policies for fear of, out of fear of China. I yeah. do think that's a it's an effective short term strategy. Until the Chinese I'm... bark back, though, I just wonder how tough we really are. I mean, when they start using the real muscle that they can and have in the past used, um, you know, when they start doing whatever the current equivalent of firing cruise missiles off the coast of Taiwan is, I want to see how tough we are. So you, uh, Ambassador Patterson made some comments about the power of American diplomacy yeah. and the use oh, of American diplomacy. And that, I mean, that, I mean, of course, she knows this better than anyone, and I got to, you know, a side, from the side, got to watch uh, my wife engage in that too. You could multiply what you're talking about times a thousand. It happens everywhere in the world on every conceivable issue that there was just this incredible number of things where everyone turns to the United States and, and that is, we're the buffer between so many nations, which is why you look at what's happening in the Middle East now, that is increasingly what it looks like when the United States doesn't have a buffer anymore. You've got the Saudis and the gutteries going at it. You've got the Saudis behaving irresponsibly in Yemen. You've got this MBS is out of control. And we could just see more and more of that because we're not there saying, no, you can't do that. Yes, you can do that. Let's, you know, you have to have that role. Okay, I got now, time for a couple more. This gentleman has this been gentleman incredibly here, patient. And then these two gentlemen there. Her Rose, uh, I think you must have ESP because you partially read my mind. I was going to ask, how much of a contribution did the Marshall Plan make in um, establishing the international world order, uh, liberal world order, and uh, would it have occurred had it not been for the Marshall Plan? Now let's just bunch these together. Let's get these other questions too. Oh, Sir. Um, hi. Uh, I'd just like to raise a different perspective just on... Just name your name and organization. Uh, so, um, Aaron Chan, uh, I'm here on vacation. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, I'd just like to raise a different interpretation of, of the liberal order because I, I agree that in large part it has served as a, as a buffer with American leadership between different bids for regional hegemony, right? But, however, imperfectly, the liberal order, as you describe it, has also um, provided a security blanket, a guarantee for weak states that would not otherwise have survived, maybe, under pressure from, say, regional um, leaders or hegemons like Iran or Saudi. And I'd just like to ask about the possibility that if human nature does not change, right, and these fundamental impulses in these different parts of the world do not change, then is it possible that freezing these conflicts, right, only fuels uh, o only fuels further conflict, right? And it, it, instead of the liberal order underwriting a peace, as you describe it, that uh, can be kept indefinitely, all it does is put a stopper on, on passions that continue to boil until they finally boil over, when any, head, any leader, whether the United States or a different state, will no longer be able to provide that kind of security blanket or that kind of guarantee. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, Ovred Kasich, uh, with TSM Global Consultants. Uh, I think fundamentally the analysis you provide is flawed with one very striking, uh, glaring uh, aspect of it. That is that the last two decades were a successful example of the functioning of an international order that preserved peace and didn't work for chaos. Because some could argue that actually the order that was created and all the flaws that developed have produced what we're seeing in the Middle East, the uh, confrontation between Saudi Arabia and Qatar, uh, and a lot of the issues that we're frustrated with, like the growth of populism and nationalism. And very quickly, two, uh, I'm very curious about two things. One is, what is your response to uh, what is, what I believe is underlying President Trump's view of a new world order that he would like to see, which is a troika, the US, China, and Russia, and a relationship that would be developed between these countries. And uh, why do you think that the only two alternatives are chaos and uh, some kind of uh, negative uh, ev evolution of the world order? Don't assume I can answer too many complex questions in a row. That's a lot of complex so, questions. Uh, I mean, I I'll, I'll do the, I got the Marshall Plan one. Okay. That's like easy. You can, you can take the hard ones. Well, no, I mean, I don't want to not take any of them. So, <laughs> okay, okay. Um, so can we just stop. Yes, All I'm saying is we we'll do those there, three. Stop and there, then, stop there, right. stop there, stop um, there. 
you know, on the Marshall Plan, obviously the Marshall Plan was critical, but the Marshall Plan wasn't going to be possible without NATO. That's the other thing that they discovered. Yes, because, yes. you know, the Europe's great fear, the, the, the fear of Germany's neighbors was that Germany would be allowed to get rich again, and Germany getting rich again meant another round. That was, that was their great fear. And so the United States had to make a commitment. We wanted to make a commitment to restoring the economic well-being of Western Europe with Germany. Um, but in order to do that, we also had to guarantee France and Britain that uh, it wouldn't lead to Germany returning to its previous course, which could, it could well have, by the way. And so it's important to just, I'm not just, everything you're saying is true. I just want to emphasize that the Marshall Plan doesn't work without the security side as well. Um, on, the, on the question of, uh, See now I've already between the two of your questions they're sorry, so sim they're similar and yet they're both so now security together. Security guarantees. You're talking about security guarantees in countries. Oh, that oh, you're, no, the, oh, right. No, you you said that we put a stopper in these problems. We didn't solve them, and that eventually they boil over. You're always putting a stopper in problems. There are that's all you're ever doing. I, you're, you don't eliminate problems. And so if these are existing conflicts waiting to happen in the international system. I think if we set Europe loose again, it really would only be a matter of time before a lot of these old problems returned. I don't think returning to the so-called German question is that far off if the United States ceases to play this role. So you're always putting a stopper on problems. And look at what we did in the Balkans in the 1990s. We haven't put an end to Balkan conflict. We certainly haven't put an end to Balkan I mean, hatred. The, the, the Serbian fights about something that happened in the 1300s or something, well, the field of blackbirds? And by the way, that's what Robert Taft said about Europe too. They've been fighting each other for centuries. What do you expect us to do? Um, so, uh, so, that, so in a way, I think it's, it's too ambitious to think that you're going to eliminate these problems. And I certainly don't think letting them play out works because when we let them play out, well, we, we saw the consequences of letting them play out. So I think we should be appropriately modest in our assessment of what we can do, and yet I believe that that modest accomplishment yields incredible benefits. And so that's, you know, in a way I was critical of Obama when he said, I don't want to just put a lid on a problem, because I think he was talking about Syria, for instance. But my feeling is we're always just putting lids on problems. We put a lid on the European problem. We put a lid on the Asian problem. You think Japan and China won't go back to conflict in a nanosecond if we're not somehow involved? So that's, that's my answer to that. And this gentleman's question was about, you're, maybe you're framing this too, sim I'm gonna, you're framing this too simplistically. There's either kind of like, either there's the order or there's chaos. And you were saying, well, isn't there another way we could have some kind of a partnership with Russia and China to kind of kind of manage the world collectively. Right, and uh, although you said something else, which I, w I didn't fully understand, but you were basically. In that case, maybe the order was breaking down; that it couldn't preserve the peace. Well, I think the order has been. I think the order has been breaking down a little over the last couple of decades. What's interesting to me is that people are blaming the order for the last couple of decades, whereas I think that what we've seen. Over, by the way. Let's not be too, um, and let me not be too idyllic in my description of what was happening in the Cold War. I mean, the Cold War was also a constant process of trying to strengthen the order, but then it was also collapsing, and then also we didn't want to do it. I mean, during the Vietnam period, America didn't want to worry about the Middle East. That's why we set up the Shah of Iran and the Saudi monarchy and said, you guys take care of it. And then, of course, that blew up in our face, right? So, um, so I'm not trying, there's never a moment when we've just got it all worked out, okay? And I don't think that there's anything special in that regard about the last two or three decades. I think it's sort of normal stuff happens even when you're maintaining the order. But I also believe that there's been a declining willingness to maintain the order, and that is part of what's been happening. My, my, my on the, yeah, sorry, go ahead. On the Troika question, First of all, I've never heard Donald Trump say he wants to rule the world with a troika. That doesn't seem to be his view toward China. And I don't even think I've heard him say that he, I think he wants to, you know, it's very hard to separate what Trump says about Russia from other things that are going on. His desire to have rapprochement with Russia strikes me as totally normal. It's exactly what the Obama administration did right after Georgia. And so it's not any different from wanting to have rapprochement. Every new president wants to wipe the slate clean with Russia and say, okay, let's figure out what we can do. So I want to separate a lot of the other stuff about Trump. But I don't think he was saying with the Russians, let's you, me, and the Chinese run this world together. I don't think he's ever been 
sell. I know I don't even want to. I don't even want to accuse him of saying that, because I don't even know what that would mean. Now let's so let's take it seriously. If you're basically saying to the Russians and Chinese, it's the three of us. We'll run this place together. Does that mean that if Russia wants to resume its historic hegemonic role in Central Europe? That we're going to grant them that yeah, we're good with that. That you know, Russia's Russia's sense of its uh, sphere of influence doesn't end in Ukraine. It begins in Ukraine. Ukraine. They don't even think Ukraine is an independent country. I mean, Russia was Ukraine. But it includes the Balts. It includes South, much of southeastern Europe, and it definitely has historically included Poland. At the very least, not allowing Poland to have an independent foreign policy. So if you're and on, on China. China doesn't think Japan has a, a, a role in their region. Um, historically, their Japan is supposed to be subservient. They're this sort of weak offshoot of Chinese culture that doesn't really have a, is not, can't be taken seriously. Korea is really nothing that's supposed to be existing independently of China. So what I'm getting at is, what does this troika look like? Because either you're giving them what they want, or you're not giving them what they want, in which case you don't have a troika. And so you tell me wh whose countries you're giving away so that we can have a nice little troika. <laughs> All right. On that, I'm going to end. <laughs> I don't it. mean this to be sarcastic, good. but no. I mean, you say, I mean, it's, this is. All right. Everyone's got to go out and buy this book, The Jungle Grows <laughs> Back, America and Our Imperiled World. Please join me in thanking my friend Bob Kagan. Thank you, Dan. That was very nice That's of you. Awesome. Oops.